Just to recap before I start, so we saw there are different types of measurement error. The main one is random error, so that means when people are not consistent, so we ask them the same thing. The true score is the same, so let's say attitudes towards immigrants is the same, but somehow they're not consistent. So sometimes they're slightly more positive, sometimes they're slightly less positive. So that we would call random error. And then we talked about systematic error, which me and Daniel don't really like that, or validity, or uh, so that's when, for example, I ask you using one method. So for example, I use a 10-point scale and you tend to kind of always be higher, more positive than when I use a 5-point scale. Okay, and that's systematic because of the way I ask you, be just because of the response scale. So that's the way why, how in survey methodology we usually conceptualize method. So a, a systematic effect due to method is because of the response scale. And then we saw for Tobias that's quite different. So what they are looking at the method is actually the rater. But the, actually the method that you use to estimate that is the same. So for us, uh, you can think of the different ways to ask the question is the same as using different raters. There are different methods to collect the data. Uh, and we don't really use interchangeable methods like you use. So all our methods are kind of fixed. So that's a difference. And uh, a ni an another nice similarity with what Tobias was talking about is that uh, this work that is with, uh, with Daniel Obersky uh, is actually we're also going to this direction of designing uh, the questions and kind of manipulating them in order to estimate measurement error. So it's also really design based and then the model is really based on kind of the design or experiment we, we built on top of it. Okay, so we have some concepts we want to measure. So for example, uh, in this cartoon, how was your pain today? Uh, and then what we're saying when I say method effect in, uh, in survey methodology, we mean that if I use a different scale instead of the smiley faces, I would get different results. But as you look at this image, you realize that maybe m that is not the main issue with asking this question. Yeah, there might be other reasons why you wouldn't give a true score. So for example, there might be some kind of peer pressure to answer in a particular way. Yeah, so that's what we call uh, social desirability in survey methodology. Yeah? So we want to present ourselves in a positive way and we really don't say the, the truth. So a nice example of that is asking people how many sexual partners they have. Men tend to overestimate and female tend to underestimate. And you'd think somewhere in between the true score should, uh, should be there. But yeah, so that would be systematic error due to social desirability. We also have other types of measurement errors. So for example, there's something called acquiescence or yes saying. So let's say you don't really want to think about the questions anymore and you just agree with whatever the person asks you. And again, that's not very good measurement, right? Because it's kind of, it's not related to what I ask and it's, it's just it's systematic because you always agree, but it's not really uh, what you want to measure. So the methods we saw so far, the uh, multi-tray, multi-method, actually makes an important assumption. It says that the only systematic bias we get in our answer is because of this. But we know that's not true. There's a huge uh, research in survey methodology that we know social desirability is an issue. We know acquiescence is an issue. There are other things like extreme response styles and so on. So the question is, well, are these methods correct? If we assume that everything is missing when we have this huge literature that says they're present. Okay, so that's kind of what we're trying to do. We're trying to get rid of these two main assumptions of the method uh, for dealing with measurement error. So one is that they look at one type of measurement error at a time, and then often they either look at means or variances. MTMM is quite good because you can do both of them. But test retest, for example, just look at uh, random variation. Uh, and other types of uh, designs that are common in survey methodology, like split ballot designs, you can only look at mean differences. You can't look at the amount of variation that is uh, systematically biased. So our aim is try trying to figure out how can we move away from the methods that exist so far and try to bypass these assumptions. So we're going to develop something on top of the MTMM uh, in which instead of assuming there are only two uh, sources of correlated variation, uh, we're going to try to estimate multiple sources of correlated variation or systematic uh, variation. Uh, and one, uh, one issue with a lot of the multi-tray, multi-method that Melanie didn't really have time to mention is that the order is not randomized. So we saw that actually memory effects might be important. 
So one way to get rid of that, because we have two measures from the same individuals, we could randomize the order of the question. So that's one way to get rid of this assumption of non-random presentation that the MTMM has. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to walk you through an example, how we develop this new method, which we call the multi-tray multi-error. Uh, so first of all, I want to, uh, uh, to thank Understand Society because they collected this data for us for free. And as you see, we have 56 experimental groups. Uh, I think they regretted that they agreed to do this after they started programming this experiment. Uh, but we're really grateful because as you see, we can do things that I don't think uh, anybody ever did before with measurement error. So what we have is we have a, a wave. I'll just look at one wave of uh, the Understand Society. Um, it is a household representative sample. It has around 2,000 people and it's used ma mainly for methodological research. Okay, so a lot of the things that will go in the main survey of Understand Society will be tested in the innovation panel. So what we have is uh, our MTME experiment, which I'll explain in a minute. We're trying to measure attitudes towards immigrants. And the reason why we chose this is because it's a very difficult topic to measure. Uh, we know attitudes are, uh, yeah, they're biased by really small things like the way you ask. We know it can be a sensitive topic, so social desirability might be a problem. So that's why we kind of went for like the most difficult thing you can measure. Uh, and then I'm going to explain how we ended up with 56 experimental groups. And how, uh, as Melanie mentioned, we have to have two measures of the questions for the same individual. So. Uh, People would be asked the questions at the beginning of the survey and then at the end of the survey in slightly different ways. And in between, there will be around half an hour of survey. Yeah? There's some limited research saying that 20 minutes is enough, but that's one of the assumptions of the method, so keep that in mind. So one way to deal with that is, again, like I mentioned, we randomize the order of the forms. So these are the questions which are very popular. They appear in the European Social Survey and uh, EVS, a number of uh, large surveys. So first you have uh, three questions. So for example, the UK should allow more people of the same race or ethnic group as most British people. And then you change this italic uh, part with different uh, people of different race and ethnic group and so on. And then we have three more questions here. Do you think that immigration in general is good for UK's economy or for UK's cultural life and so on? So these are the six questions we want to ask and they, uh, yeah, they measure attitudes towards immigrants. So, so far we saw that in order to estimate MTMM you have to kind of uh, randomize the method that you use. So we can use two points and five points and then we see if they agree or not and that's how we estimate method effects. But what we are thinking, well, why just randomize one thing? Why don't we randomize multiple characteristics of the questions at the same time and estimate multiple types of systematic errors? So for example, instead of just manipulating the method, uh, which we did using either a two point or a 11 point scale, we also uh, manipulate two other things. So for social desirability, what we do is we change the stem of the question. So for example, here, the stem is that the UK should allow more people of the same race. And what we did is we randomized if they, have, if they get allow more or allow fewer. And the, the, the idea behind this that we kind of imply was the social norm. We're kind of saying most people think that this is the social norm. And if they tend to answer in a socially desirable way, they tend to agree with the rest of the people. So uh, that's kind of subtle. So we said, well, okay, we'll see if that works or not. And the other thing that we manipulated is if the response scale is agree, disagree, or disagree, agree. And again, the idea is that if it's agree, disagree, people will tend to agree easier. It's easier to agree with that. Uh, and you tend to get more acquiescence. Yeah? So if we combine these, we actually get eight ways in which you can ask the same question. So here is just the first question. Uh, UK should allow fewer people of the same race. So the first wording, uh, social desirability is higher. It has a two point response scale. It is agree, disagree, and it's negatively worded. So it has fewer in it. Uh, so these people were asked the negative question and then the response scale was agree, disagree with two points. The second way in which I can ask the question is wording two. It's again two point, agree, disagree, but now it's positively worded. So we should allow more. And then uh, wording three is 11 points, agree, disagree, negative. 
So these are all the different ways in which you could, we could ask the same question. Yeah. Uh, so these are the wordings, and what we did is people got one wording at the beginning and one wording at the end, and then this was randomized. Yeah. So if you combine all of these, all possible combinations, you get 56 experimental groups. So this is wha what we did in our, in our design. OK, so do I have one of these graphs? Oh, yeah, of course I have one of these graphs. So uh, I won't go into it. Actually, this is not the entire one. So this is one question. Yeah. So this is question one. Uh, question one, wording one. Question one, wording two, until wording eight. And this is similar to what we saw before. So we have a true score, which basically says, well, these some have to be consistent somehow. They're all the same question about the same topic. They have to measure the same thing. Then we're saying, well, for example, these, uh, these two and these two are measured with 11 point scale. So they have something in common because they have the same response scale. So this is what we call the method effect. Uh, and then social desirability and acquiescence is the same. So they're uh, we code the loadings depending if they're, for example, positively worded or negatively worded. Yeah? And acquiescence if they're agree, disagree, or disagree, agree. So I won't go into the details of this. If you want to discuss this, I'm very, very happy to discuss it. But I have a feeling that you might have enough of these graphs by the end of the session. Um, OK, so now on to the results. So we can estimate both systematic, uh, we can uh, estimate both mean bias and variance bias. So that's kind of one advantage of this method. So the way to read these numbers is that if I give you agree, disagree versus disagree, agree, you'll have a shift in the mean of the response of, one, uh, of 0 0.25 standard deviations. That's just because it's agree, disagree versus disagree, agree. Okay. The same for social desirability. If I change one word, so if I say fewer instead of more, I have a shift in the mean of the observed item by 0.18 standard deviation. And the same for method. Actually, if I, if I use a 11 point uh, scale, I tend to be less extreme than if I have a two point scale on average by 0.47. OK. And this could go in different directions depending on how the question is asked. But at one extreme, all of them could go in the same direction and you could have a shift of one standard deviation just because of the way you asked, which is slightly concerning for measurement. But there you go. The next thing that we did, which is kind of uh, exciting, is to decompose the variation. So we have uh, we have the total variation of a question, and we want to know how much of it is actually what we want to measure, what we were calling true score before, or trait, and how much is these other types of errors. So this is kind of over all the questions and all the different ways to estimate things, this is the average result. So on average, the, actually the, valid, uh, the proportion of valid variation we get is around 60%, and all the rest is, is bias. Okay? Uh, the biggest part is random error, so, and this is similar actually to what we found in other studies in survey methodology, which is around 20%, and then we have uh, the rest of the, sy the systematic errors. Okay. And again, we never were able to do something like this before. Until now, we always, for example, we only had method, uh, and we assumed that there were, were not there. And the nice thing with this is that now we know how important is method compared to others. Yeah? And also it gives us an idea what are the best ways to ask a particular question. So for example, if I, want, I have six questions, if I want to find out which is the best question, which question should I use, well, I can decompose, do the same decomposition for each question. And I see, for example, the worst question is this one, the first one, where more than 50% is, is biased variation. Yeah, and we see the last three questions are actually better than the first three. Uh, so this would be an indication. Well, maybe we should just use the last three questions, and maybe we should uh, do something about the first three. Another way to look at this is well, we had the eight different ways to ask the question, so I can do the same decomposition depending on the different wordings. So that would give me an idea what is the best way to ask these questions. So here we see that actually the main difference is between wordings one, two, five, and six compared to the others. 
And the main difference between these is these are two-point scales versus 11-point scales. So actually, our, our finding is that the two-point scales are better than the 11-point scale. And one thing that is hidden here is that actually the two-point scales has less variation, right? So this is kind of the hidden thing here. Two-point scale, less variation, but more reliable versus 11-point scale, more variation, but more bias. Okay. Okay, and then actually we can do a combination and see, well, is some wordings better for some questions than others? So I won't go into details, but this is kind of an example of what you can do. Okay, so the next thing that I'll do is I'll chat a little about the longitudinal aspect. So I'm not even going to try to show you the graph of how to estimate that. Uh, but what I did basically is the same model in three waves. So it's really nice because understand, uh, the innovation panel is a panel. So we have multiple waves of the same uh, people. So we can actually look and see what happens longitudinally. So what I did is did the same model for all the three waves and try to see how is systematic error changing in time. And again, I don't think we really did this before. So let's see some of the results. So on the left, we have the mean of the different types of systematic errors, so acquiescence method and social desirability. And on the right, we have the variance. So the variance is what we use in the decomposition of the variance, and this is what we estimated initially for the mean bias. Uh, so actually, none of the differences are systematic. So it means that there's no systematic change for any of these. So it means they're stable in time. Okay, so this is one of our findings that uh, for example, none of these uh, goes significantly up or down in time. So that kind of contradicts uh, panel conditioning. So panel conditioning says actually people get better at answering questions in time, so we expect some of maybe some of the systematic biases to go down. That's not really what we found. Another way to look at this is, again, we have, for example, the questions and then we have the decomposition by wave underneath. And we see that the sizes of these systematic errors are similar, but actually the sizes of the random errors tend to go down. Okay? So this, on the other hand, supports the panel conditioning uh, hypothesis that people ha are yeah, more reliable in time. The more you ask the same question, the more reliable they are. Uh, and then, yeah, you can do more complicated things. So you can have, a combi like I said, a combination of the wording and the uh, the question by wave. And again, you can see if there are different patterns for different um, kind of combinations. Okay, so this is kind of the conclusion. So we, uh, me and Daniel proposed this method called the multi-train multi-error, and we show that it's possible to estimate multiple types of uh, measurement error at the same time. And actually, this is just an example of the design you can use. So our, what we're saying is that if you think you have a type of systematic uh, measurement error in your question, just manipulate that and try to estimate it, okay? It doesn't have to be this complicated. It could be simpler as long as you have a hypothesis about the measurement error you expect. Um, then uh, we saw that you need this kind of within experimental design, so the same people have to answer multiple times, <coughs> and you assume you don't have any memory effects. And one way to make that more plausible is to shift the order of the forms, so there's no systematic bias. For the substantive conclusion, we saw that random error is the highest non-trait variance, which is kind of encouraging because a lot of the methods we have for measurement error only estimate uh, random, uh, random error. So it means that already that's a good thing. If we can estimate and correct for random error, we're halfway there. Uh, we saw that the correlated errors or the systematic errors have an impact both on the mean and the variances. And we saw they can be quite big. So up to one standard deviation shift in the mean and up to 50% of the variation, which is kind of concerning for uh, the social sciences, I would say. Uh, then we saw that, actually I didn't really talk about this, but we saw that the method, so actually the scale you use, uh, influences both the reliability and the amount of social desirability. So we actually found more social desirability if you use a 11-point scale than if you use a 2-point scale. But I didn't really go in into depth to that with that. And then the final conclusion was that systematic errors do not change in time, although random errors seem to decrease in time. So there's some partial support for the panel conditioning hypothesis. 
so yeah, do we solve all the problems in the world using these super complicated mo uh, models? So probably not. So I think we get some insight about the questions and uh, the kind of the best ways to answer, uh, to, to ask questions, and also about the trade-offs. So we can see, okay, method of how big is method effect compared to something else. But then there are some disadvantages. It's quite hard to program and estimate this method. So yeah, it will be, yeah, it's hard to convince other people to use it. But again, we argue that you can do a smaller version of this, uh, something like MTMM or a little more complicated than the MTMM in order to really understand your data and the measurement error. Okay, that's it. Thank you.